Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the organizing committee of the PIMSA Congress, allow me to warmly welcome all of you to the inauguration of the 16th International Medical Congress organized by PIMSA. My name is Pavita Bekon, and this is my co-host, Humangi Karunaratna, and we are both proud products of our great alma mater, the Faculty of Medicine, University of Peradeniya. We are indeed privileged to be your hosts for this splendid evening, which I'm sure will be remembered for years to come, and we are pleased to witness this distinguished audience gathered here today. Every two years, the PEMSA International Congress is held, and today we are about to witness the inauguration of the 16th such Congress. Allow me to mention today's chief guest, Professor Emeritus and past president of PEMSA, Professor Neela Kanti Ratnatunga, who is a beloved teacher to many generations of medical students, including many of the audience here today. We also have our guest of honor, Dr. Krish Radhakrishnan, a former postgraduate dean and the immediate past president of the PEMSA UK, who has been supporting us continually in numerous ways to uplift the academic and financial circumstances of the faculty. And today, the honor of delivering the esteemed Congress lecture has fallen upon the capable shoulders of Professor Kemal Dean, who is a brilliant product of the Peradeniya Medical Faculty, and Professor Emeritus at the University of Kalania. Thank you, sir, for gracing us with your presence. I'm sure most of you have registered for the academic sessions, but if you have not, allow me to extend a warm invitation to everyone to register for the sessions, which will begin tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. at the Oak Ray Regency. Celebrating its 31st year, on behalf of PEMSA, we once again warmly welcome all of you to the inaugural ceremony of the 16th International Medical Congress. You now hear the Candian drums as the procession comprising the chief guest, guest of honor, Congress lecturer, other dignitaries, and the Council of PEMSA is being escorted to the hall to initiate the proceedings of the inauguration ceremony of the 16th International Medical Congress. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all rise as the procession enters the hall and remain standing for the national anthem and lighting of the oil lamp.
And now let us remain standing as we sing our national anthem with pride. In keeping with our Sri Lankan heritage, it is now time to light the traditional oil lamp to signify the dispelling of darkness and ushering in of light. For this, we cordially invite the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of the University of Peradeniya, representing the Vice-Chancellor, who is the patron of PEMSA, Professor Terence Madhujit, the Chief Guest, Professor Neelakanti Ratnatunga, the Guest of Honour, Dr. Krish Radhakrishnan, the Congress Lecturer, Professor Kemal Dean. The Dean, Faculty of Medicine, Professor Vasanti Pinto. The Directors of NHSL, Teaching Hospital Peradeniya, and Sirimao Bandaranaika Specialized Children's Hospital, Dr. Iresha Fernando, Dr. Ar Arjuna Tilakaratna, and Dr. Veera Bandara. President of PEMSA, Professor Tushara Kudagamana. Congress Chairperson, Professor Heshan Jaivira. Representing the past presidents, Dr. Lionel Vimalasiri. Representing PEMSA Australasia, Dr. Priyani Yapa. Secretary PEMSA, Professor Champa Ratnatunga. The Treasurer of PEMSA, Professor Manoji Patiragi. And the Congress Secretary, Dr. Chaturika Dandini.
Before moving on to today's proceedings, let us take a moment to remember our beloved alumni who have left us, including Dr. Joel Fernando and Dr. Maitri Rajapaksha, the first and second presidents of PEMSA. We will observe a minute's silence to remember them and pay respectful tribute to these giants on whose shoulders we stand today. Thank you. Please take your seats. PIMSA was born more than 30 years ago when a group of doctors from the very first batch of medical students, while reminiscing about their days in Pera Denier, felt that it would be fitting to confer and exchange ideas with others in their batch and faculty who were spread all over the world. Many, if not all, excelled in their chosen field of medicine, and such a collaboration was welcomed with great enthusiasm, and thus began the concept of an international medical congress. To name a few of the pioneers, Dr. Joel Fernando, Dr. Palita Abekun, the late Dr. W.D.H. Pereira, Dr. W.P. Somasiri, Dr. Neil Halpe, Dr. Manu Kulasuria, Dr. He Masiri, Professor T. Varugunam and Dr. Rudra Rasaretnam were but a few who were instrumental in initiating the first International Medical Congress in 1992. It was also decided to have a Congress lecture as the highlight of the occasion, of which an invitation was extended to an alumnus who excelled in scientific research and continued to, continues to be an esteemed tradition even today. To be invited to deliver the Congress lecture is considered a great honor amongst our alumni. After the first Medical Congress, which was no doubt a resounding success, the famous first batch laid the groundwork for what would become Sri Lanka's first medical alumni association, PIMSA. And since its inception, PIMSA has spearheaded the improvement of academic standards, providing financial assistance to needy students, and galvanizing undergraduate and postgraduate research, as well as the steady support it continues to extend to all aspects of the development of its alma mater. And now, moving on to today's proceedings, let me take this opportunity to invite the following distinguished guests to take their seats at the head table. The chief guest, Professor Neil Karanthi Ratnatunga, the guest of honor, Dr. Krish Radhakrishnan, the Congress lecturer, Professor Kemal Dean, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Terence Madhujit, Dean, Faculty of Medicine, Professor Vasanthi Pinto, President Pemsa, Professor Tushara Kudagamana, the Congress Chairman, Professor Heshan Jayavira, and the Congress Secretary, Dr. Chaturika Dandeni. And now, to welcome this esteemed gathering, I cordially invite Professor Hesha Jayavira, the Congress Chairperson, to deliver the welcome address.
the chief guest, Professor Neelakanti Ratnatunga, the guest of honor, Dr. Krish Radhakrishnan and Mrs. Radhakrishnan, the Congress lecturer, Professor Kemal Dean and Mrs. Dean, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Dean, Faculty of Medicine, uh, directors of National Hospital Kendi, Teaching Hospital Peradenia, and Sirimau Vanda Naika Specialized Children's Hospital, past presidents and Congress chairpersons of PEMSA, our special invitees, members of the council, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Congress committee, let me extend a very warm welcome to all of you who are present here today. We are happy that we have been able to organize yet another Congress with physical participation following the COVID pandemic and the recent economic instability in, of our country. The theme for this year's Congress is delivering holistic care amidst challenges, which I'm sure you would all agree is very timely. We are indeed very happy to have an outstanding alumnus of Peradenia and a very vibrant and active member of PEMSA as our chief guest, Professor Neela Kanti Ratnatunga. Dear Madam, Thank you very much for accepting our invitation to add glamour and color to our Congress. Our guest of honor, Dr. Krish Radhakrishnan, is one of the leading figures of the PEMSA UK. He was instrumental in revitalizing PEMSA UK and during his tenure as president and has made much effort to reestablish links with Peradenia for the benefit of our undergraduates and postgraduates. Dr. Radhakrishnan, thank you very much for honoring our invitation and a very warm welcome back to Sri Lanka. The key highlight of the inauguration is the Congress lecture, which will be delivered by yet another outstanding alumnus. Let me extend a very warm welcome to Professor Kemal Dean. I would also like to thank the Deputy Vice Chancellor and the Dean for their presence, and I would like to assure you that PEMSA is determined to support the faculty and uplift facilities of our alma mater to create better learning environments for our undergraduates. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of the Provincial Director of Helps, the Services the directors of teaching hospitals, Peradenia, Kandy, and National Hospital, uh, Kandy, and all consultants and academics who have made an effort to be with us here tonight. I would also like to warmly welcome alumni who have traveled from UK and Australia to join us in solidarity. It is wonderful to see all of you gathered here this evening and we are enriched by your presence. It is also my pleasure to welcome very warmly into our midst the retired teachers who will be felicitated today and the members of our resource panel. I'm indeed grateful to the overseas speakers who have taken trouble to visit Sri Lanka to be physically present for the event. We concluded three pre-Congress workshops three days ago, which were well attended, and the scientific program has been carefully planned to cover a wide range of topics in keeping with our theme, delivering holistic patient care amidst challenges. I hope the updates and insights of our panel of experts provide, will, will provide the uh, uh, attendees to improve practice despite the many challenges present in the healthcare system of Sri Lanka today. I also take this opportunity to, to express my sincere thank to President Pemsa, Professor Tushara Kudagamana, and all members of the Congress Committee who rallied around me and worked tirelessly to make this Congress a reality. Pemsa has also been fortunate enough to receive sponsorships during a difficult time for almost all sectors, and I would like to very sincerely acknowledge those who have supported us. Let me conclude once again thanking all of you for your presence today 
and I may, may I sincerely request you to join us tomorrow at the scientific sessions as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Today's event would not have been possible without your untiring efforts. PEMSA has been a backbone to the Faculty of Medicine from day one, working hand in hand with the faculty administration for the betterment of the students. This invitation is warmly extended to the Dean, Faculty of Medicine, Professor Vasanti Pinto, to now address the gathering. Thank you, Omangi. The Honorable Chief Guest, Emeritus Professor Neela Kanti Ratatunga, the Guest of Honor, Dr. Krish Radhakrishna, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, University of Philadelphia, Professor Terence Matajit, the Congress Lecturer, Professor Kemal Dean, Professor Tushara Kudagamana, the President PEMSA 2122, Professor Heshan Jayavira, the Congress Chair, the Council and Committee of Members, all past presidents, directors of the affiliated teaching hospitals to the faculty, special invitees, consultants, medical officers, medical students, and ladies and gentlemen. The Faculty of Medicine is celebrating 61 years in 2023, with 56 batches of alumni who have passed through its portals and contributed in measure towards local and global efforts in advancing medicine and patient care to superlative standards in their respective fields of duty and specialization. As an alumnus and the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, I consider it's a privilege to speak to you at the 16th PEMSA International Conference 2023. This PEMSA conference not only provides knowledge, but also an opportunity to renew friendships and engage in fellowship with the refreshing of social ties in keeping with unique, friendly tradition of our alma mater. Indeed, our alumni have done much to enhance the standards of education of both undergraduates and postgraduate students and contributed immensely to supporting needy students of our faculty with the singular purpose of being united on a single platform towards this charitable and beneficial focus with much enthusiasm. After a break due to the COVID pandemic, I'm so happy to witness the PEMSA conference making a comeback in 2023, and I want to congratulate the president of PEMSA 2020, 20, 2021, Professor Tushara Kutagamana, the conference chair, Professor Heshan Jaivir, and the organizing committee who have worked hard to stage this conference. Let me also extend a warm welcome to the international and local experts taking part in this year's event, which is being held after a difficult period of turmoil in the history of our isles, with its attended social and disastrous economic consequences, though now remote, are still being felt. The presence of these delegates is welcoming and indeed a valuable addition to this conference. The presence of the eminent delegates and the topics of diverse clinical interest they would be deliberating on will undoubtedly generate much interest among the participants and open doors for the further perseverance of the spirit of inquiry and interest. I'm sure this conference will direct the attendees to interactively learn, share, and supplement their knowledge on different clinical disciplines of interest while keeping up to date with the newer strengths, with the resultant objective of, the, of participating in this conference, translating to more enhanced patient care with better clinical outcomes. My earnest hope at this juncture is that this mutually reciprocative relationship between our faculty and its alumni will continue to blossom widening to broader and bigger horizons to connect all alumnus, which from the faculty's perspective will empower chances of invaluable inputs for the benefit of our faculty and its undergraduates. Maintaining healthy ties with this parent organization 
and the faculty also provides an opportunity for the alumni to be updated on the development and academic trends and be actively sensitive to the needs of our faculty. This event will undoubtedly be greatly rewarding with a rich social dimension that will translate to the enrichment of academic and clinical expertise in the ambience of friendship and cheer. I wish this conference all success. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam, for your inspiring words and for the tremendous service you render to our alma mater. And now, to grace the stage, we, wa we welcome Professor Terence Madhujit, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of the University of Peradeniya, to address the gathering. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, my talk falls after a lovely talk by Professor Vasanthi Pinto. Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> I'm representing the Vice Chancellor today, who is also happened to be the patron of PEMSA, who is away from the country. So, uh, Chief Guest, Professor Neelakanth Ratnatunga, Guest of Honor, Dr. Radhakrishna, mm, the Congress Speaker, Professor Kamal Dean, uh, Professor Vasanthi Pinto, the Dean, Faculty of Medicine. Professor Tushara Kudagamana, the President, PEMSA. Mm, Professor Heshan Jayavira, Congress Chair. All other PEMSA office bearers. Uh, director of, directors of hospitals, academic members from Faculty of Medicine, medical officers, medical students, ladies and gentlemen. So this is a script that I received from the Vice Chancellor, so I will read the entire script. I appreciate your invitation to attend the 16th International Medical Congress, but I deeply regret my inability to do so as I am attending an internationalization week organized by a leading university in Europe. Therefore, I feel it's relevant to speak a few words about internationalization attempts of the University of Peradeniya, the limitations, and more specifically, and importantly, the alumni role in the internationalization of Peradeniya. At the outset, let me appreciate the leadership and leading role played by the PEMSA in the affairs of the Faculty of Medicine. I have seen over the years the enthusiasm of the membership towards the welfare of the faculty and its students. It was most prominent in recent times through your effort to help the students affected by economic crisis. Universities abroad are seeking to go global, largely to attract fee-living students, academic and student exchanges and research collaborations also to help universities in less developed countries in developing their capacity. This trend is more than just a passing fad. However, foreign colleges and their alumni have been more persistent than local universities like ours in achieving the goals of globalization. We lag behind due to a number of reasons, including the use of the buzzword internationalization in our vision and mission statements, but a lack of seriousness in our plans across all significant divisions and faculties, structural deficiencies, a lack of funding, uncertainties in the timetables caused by disruptions, and not allowing students who have the means to gain international experience to do it. The University of Peradeniya, however, has placed adequate emphasis on appointing scholars from other countries as honorary professors and adjunct professors, establishing research collaborations, applying for capacity development and research grants with foreign universities, and promoting inward student mobility, both elective and full-time. Currently, I understand that the Faculty of Medicine has nearly 50 undergraduates from other nations. 
we recently organized an international week that featured lectures from foreign academics, cultural programs made possible with the, with the help of several embassies. Uh, the role of alumni in internationalization. Alumni can contribute in different ways. We are residing in an untrapped gold mine. Given the amount of alumni who hold significant academic and professional positions all over the world. That, that is evidence because I know that PEMSA has a number of branches in countries like uh, Australia, the UK, the U United States and also Bhutan. The university must take certain actions in order to get their support, including frequent communication, acknowledging their accomplishments, fostering a discussion, sharing their new permitting, the use of university facilities, encouraging visits, so on and so forth. Some of those activities are carried out by alumni clubs like yours but central administration can take further steps, which is why the university formed an early stage alumni relations office. There's more opportunity for us to ask them to participate in our scholarly endeavors. Activities that more affluent graduates can give to include endowment chairs and expanding infrastructure facilities. I invite you to take the lead in enhancing our university's presence in the international community beyond our current ranking among top 5% of the world, perhaps to advance to among the 3% of the world universities. In light of dedication and capacity of the PEMSA, its rolling leadership and its members, Professor M.D. Lamavansa, uh, Vice Chancellor, University of Peradini. Well, that is from him. Uh, if I do not talk a few words, uh, that would create a small vacuum. So, uh, to this learned uh, group of medical professionals, University of Peradini has been ranked as the one of the top 5% universities in the world. Just a couple of months ago, US Global News announced that our university is, is, our rank is 901 among 2,200 global best universities. And ladies and gentlemen, University of Peradini is the only university coming to that category in Sri Lanka. And one of the prestigious ranking system that we have, that's Times Higher Education Ranking, according to to Times Higher Education Ranking, we have been ranked number one over the last four consecutive years. That itself highlights the importance of University of Peradeniya. Well, PEMSA has done an enormous job, especially after, in the aftermath of COVID pandemic, this country faced enormous financial difficulties. There, when we were in need, you helped a lot. So that's I salute as the head of the institution for today, um, the activities of PEMSA. I have seen PEMSA buses and so many contributions. This is the 16th International Congress that, International Medical Congress that you are organizing, which is very valuable, sharing knowledge. Just a few, couple of examples. Uh, yesterday we heard on news the paracetamol poisoning, as a result of paracetamol poisoning, kid of seven years old from Gampala area, she died, apparently due to paracetamol poisoning. But perhaps the reason is, according to what came up on media, the way that the drug has been dispensed was not acceptable. Fast spread of NCDs in the country, it's alarming the cardiovascular diseases, cancer, diabetes, mellitus, just to name few, and chronic lung diseases. So have we done enough as from a non-medical man? Um, the obesity and overweight, childhood obesity, the country average is 4.6%, 
but in urban areas it exceeds 20%. The undiagnosed hypertension in Sri Lanka. Hypertension is recorded to be nearly 30% in the country. Sugar consumption. A fairly high sugar consumption and carbohydrate consumption in the country. Well, one of the very popular drinks in this country coming in dispensers. So that manager happened to be one of my former students. So I asked this person, why are you feeding a lot of sugar to the nation? Then he told me that, sir, we introduced low sugar version, but there's no demand. So this is what people request. So we gave up. So there's something wrong. Antimicrobial resistance that we are promoting antimicrobial stewardship, but are we doing enough? Haphazard and overuse of antimicrobials is one of the problems in the country. Dengue epidemic last year, by October, there were 49,000 cases of dengue last year. This year it's going to be even more, looks like. So have we done enough? Primordial prevention, Madam Nilakanti. Uh, have we paid adequate attention to primordial prevention? Disease surveillance and epidemiological studies, I think we are lagging behind. So in this sense, I think, I'm sure, PEMSA would take the lead in, and it will be the driving force for the Faculty of Medicine, University of Peradhania. Without much ado, let me congratulate the PEMSA, and I wish the tomorrow's sessions will be a great success. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for those words of encouragement and wisdom. We know it is no easy feat to be present here despite your busy schedule. PEMSA has always been led by the best, and our current president is no different. It is my pleasure and privilege to now invite President PEMSA, Professor Tushara Kudagamana, to deliver the presidential address and to introduce our esteemed guest of honor. Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. The chief guest today, Professor Neela Khanti Rattunga. The guest of honor, Dr. Krish Radhakrishnan. The Congress lecturer, Professor Kemal Dean. Deputy Vice Chancellor of the University of Peradhania, Professor Terence Mandijit. Dean of the faculty, Professor Vasanta Pintu. Guest speakers of the conference, Congress Chairman, Professor K. Sanjay Viru, and the Organized Committee. Consultants, academics, council members, our own alumni, Invitees, ladies and gentlemen. I consider it an honor and a privilege to talk to you at the inauguration ceremony of the 16th Biannual International Medical Conference of PEMSA 2023 as a current president of Peradini Medical School Alumni Association. This is the highlight of PEMSA calendar. PEMSA, as you all know, is the first and the most active alumni association among medical schools of Sri Lanka. In addition to the mother organization, we have vibrant overseas chapters in Australasia, UK, Bhutan, and North America. Some of them are represented here today by alumni who have come all the way here to be with us at this 16th Congress. Peradini Medical School Alumni Association was established in the year 1992. The membership has since spread all over the country and to many parts of the world, serving a global citizenship with caring and excellence. PEMSA is the umbrella under which alumni gather to fulfill the vision of the association, which is to enable the faculty, its students, and its alumni sail far and wide with the winds of change. The main objective of the PEMSA is to promote welfare and development of medical students and the alumni. Our council carried out a plan of activities over the last two years under three main themes which were activities to help graduate a doctor who is human, who has achieved their full potential, 
is confident and who loves the faculty and infra infrastructure development and activities as a vibrant central organization. Over the last two years, we have organized academic lectures and career guidance sessions for students, soft skill development programs made available for all alumni, continue to support student needs in these difficult times by organizing and coordinating the bursary programs, as well as, as, as numerous other donations of tabs and textbooks, and work with regional and national clinical societies and colleges on continuous medical education programs and academic sessions. We also took our agenda to the community, undertaking community outreach projects, as well as mass media based public education programs. The culmination of these two years is the International Medical Congress, which is held biannually and serves to update the medical fraternity. The Congress theme this time, delivering holistic patient care amidst challenges, is most relevant to the harsh conditions that currently prevail in the country. The organizing committee, ably led by Professor Heshan Jaiveera and Chaturika Dr. Chaturika Dandaniya have set up a wonderful academic program supplemented by three pre-Congress workshops for the doctors and nurses, which were held successfully over the past few days. Organizing an event of this caliber is no easy task. This evening, evening's proceedings and tomorrow's Congress have been meticulously planned by Professor Heshan Jaiveera, who is known for his attention to detail and his team. I take this opportunity to congratulate the committee for a job well done. I would also like to thank all of you who have taken off your busy schedules to attend the inauguration. We hope you will join us at the academic sessions which will be held at Oak Ray Regency, Gatambe, tomorrow. I wish all of you for a successful PEMSA Conference 2023. Thank you. Now, let me uh, introduce uh, uh, the guest of honor today, Dr. Krish Radhakrishnan. It is my pleasure to introduce a true friend of PEMSA, Dr. Krish Tambaya Radhakrishnan. Krish entered the Faculty of Medicine in Peradinia in 1976, was a vice president, Medical Students Association in 1979. He completed the internship in surgery at Candy General Hospital and Medicine in the professorial unit at Peradeniya Teaching Hospital. Then he took up the SHO Strategist Post in surgery at Candy General Hospital before migrating to U United, United Kingdom in 1984. In United Kingdom, Dr. Radhakrishnan pursued a career in general, general practice and was a senior partner and a trainer in a teaching and training practice in Essex. He was a West Essex training program director for five years and was then appointed as an associate postgraduate dean and Cambridgeshire patch director, then Essex patch director at Health Education East of England from 2006 until mid-2019. He was a vice chair of the United Kingdom Conference of Educational Advisors and the external advisor to Royal College of General Practice on quality management of national GP training assessments. He is a visiting honorary fellow of University of Peradeniya and also one of the overseas members of the Sri Lanka Journal of Medicine editorial board. Krish was a founding president of the new PEMSA UK and held the post from inception in June 2017 to September 2021. During his tenure, he fostered and promoted close relations with the Faculty of Medicine, University of Peradeniya, and PEMSA. He was instrumental in initiating and leading major projects supporting students' welfare for their academic progress. Without much ado, let me invite our dear Dr. Chris Radhakrishnan to address you. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Good evening. Professor Javira, the Chairman, PEMSA President Professor Kudagamana, 
Dean, President Professor Vasanti Pinto, the Vi Deputy Vice Chancellor Professor Madhijith, the Congress Speaker Professor Kamal Dean, the Chief Guest Professor Nilakanti Ratnatunga, respected teachers and friends. I'm deeply honored and privileged to have been invited as a guest of honor to this esteemed 16th Congress. I wish to thank you all for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. We are extremely and eternally grateful to our medi medical school for educating us and training us. Both the medical school and the campus life not only quenched our thirst for knowledge, but also given wider social networking and psychological tranquility in a picturesque environment. So in essence, we receive a holistic care in this prosperous environment. On a personal note, my family and I are indebted to this university and the medical school, where four of my immediate family members gained our basic MBBS from this school. My brother, who was in Nilakanti's batch, my sister, who was in Kamal's year, and I was fortunate and lucky to have met my wife, or future partner, in this prosperous university. I'm glad to say that all four of us have been actively participating in the PEMSA events and activities around the globe and in the, our adapted countries of United States of America, Australia, and United Kingdom. Let me take this opportunity to say a few words about PEMSA UK. Six years ago, during the 13th Congress, Professor Kapila Gunavadana, a close friend of mine, put me on the spot at this same venue. I remember standing on a similar podium and pledging that we will establish PEMSA in the United Kingdom. United Kingdom has the largest number of PEMSA Paradenia alumni, larger than, larger alumni population next to the Sri Lanka. Some of us felt it's the right time to rekindle and reignite the passion of the UK alumni. On 17th of June, 2017, 2017, the concept became a reality and we inaugurated the new PEMSA UK under the auspicious presence and blessings of late Professor Varagunam. As the founding president of this esteemed association, there were plenty of challenges and rewards. The most importantly, it has given me enormous pleasure working with committed and dedicated executive committee members to achieve what we pledge on our constitution and policies. We have built a strong, and a sincere relationship with our parent PEMSA, the past and present deans, and the academic staff of the medical faculty. There were many who helped us along the way, but I would like to take this opportunity to thank Professors Channa Ratnatunga, Vajira Virasinga, Asanti Pinto, Ranjit Kumar Sri, Kapila Gunavadana, Asri Abhya Gunavadana, Tushara Kudagamana, Champa Ratnatunga, and Kalana Madhuvage for your continued support and encouragement. Vasanti, I owe you a special thanks because we were being the partners in crime in establishing various projects. Thank you. PEMSA UK has successfully established many student welfare projects as well as 
donated books to the library. We are on the fourth year of sponsorship of International Journals of Medicine and Surgery. We have set up a PIMSA UK Academic Awards to encourage at the grassroots level on research and uh, audits, etc. With a vision to inspire undergraduates and postgraduates to involve in impactful research projects throughout their career. This year, we hope at least one of the winning team would have an opportunity to present their work at our 2023 International Academic Conference to be hosted in Oxford University. We have an active post-MD mentorship program to support, guide, and improve the networking in the United Kingdom. We expect the local encouragement and awareness for, for the take on more trainees to take on this opportunity to make the best out of their visit in the United Kingdom. PEMSA UK will continue to work collaboratively with the faculty staff to offer career guidance or workshops for those who are wanting to visit the Western countries and other specialty-based workshops to support the undergraduate and postgraduate training and education. Though PEMSA UK may not have achieved the pinnacle yet, I can assure that this association will work passionately towards assisting and attaining the betterment, the facilities for our alma mater and her students. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that invigorating speech. And thank you so much for accepting our invitation and flying all the way from the UK to grace us with your presence. And to show our gratitude, I call upon Professor Kudugamana to hand over a token of appreciation to Dr. Radhakrishnan. Thank you, sirs. Our chief guest for the night is yet another exemplary personality who is no stranger to us. So, to do justice to her being here, I call upon Professor Heshan Jayavira, Congress Chair, to introduce our chief guest. Distinguished members of the head table, Distinguished invitees, ladies and gentlemen, our chief guest tonight, Professor Nilakanti Ratnatunga, needs no introduction to many of you who are present here today. However, to observe formalities, I will now give a brief introduction of her. Young Nilakanti Ekanayaka had her secondary education at Girls High School, Kandy, where she was the head prefect, and entered University of Peradeniya in 1973. Here, she obtained her MBBS with honors, being placed first in her batch. She joined the Department of Pathology in 1980, completed her PhD in 1986, and won the Commonwealth Medical Fellowship to undergo further training in the United Kingdom. Upon her return, she was board certified as a consultant histopathologist in 1992. 
She was promoted as the professor of pathology in the year 2000 and became a senior professor in 2007. In the same year, she secured a senior Commonwealth Fellowship to undergo further training at the Imperial College School of Medicine in the United Kingdom. She was also elected a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh in 2011. Professor Ratnatunga introduced immunohistochemistry and established renal histopathology and immunofluorescence services in the Department of Pathology and has offered her expert opinion to many nephrology units in all parts of Sri Lanka. She served as the head of Department of Pathology for 18 years and supervised many postgraduate trainees. Many of us who have been taught by her as undergraduates or postgraduates would remember what an excellent teacher and trainer she was in a career spanning over three decades. During the said period, she published extensively and has been the recipient of many prizes and awards. She was elected the president of the College of Pathologists in 2001 and also served as the chairman of the Board of Study in Pathology. Upon her retirement, she was bestowed the honor of Professor Emeritus by the University of Peradeniya. Professor Ratnathunga, apart from being an outstanding academic, engaged herself in many other activities. She was the president of the Peradeniya Medical School Alumni Association from 2010 to 2012, the year the faculty celebrated the Golden Jubilee. The PEMSA, under her leadership, organized one of the best medical congresses witnessed so far. She was instrumental in initiating the PEMSA studentship, which currently fosters some of the needy medical students. Following her success at the PEMSA, she was elected president of the Candy Society of Medicine in 2015. Some of the key highlights of her presidency were the live webcasts of monthly clinical updates of the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh, which immensely benefited our postgraduate trainees, and the revival of the Sri Lanka Journal of Medicine. Being taught by her as an undergraduate and later as a junior colleague in the faculty, having closely worked with her for more than a decade, I have found out how organized this lady is. She's a master planner, a silent observer, and has great ability to identify unique talents of individuals. She leads from the front while allowing her juniors to flourish and is very meticulous in whatever he, she does. She was a very dedicated teacher and is well known for her punctuality, discipline, and straightforwardness. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you will agree with me, Professor Ratnatunga has been an outstanding alumnus of our faculty. Thank you, Madam, for accepting our invitation and gracing this occasion. May I now call Professor Neelakanthi Ratnatunga to address the gathering. Thank you. The Deputy Vice Chancellor, sir, members of the head table, Congress lecturer Professor Kemal Dean, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, Heshan, I'm deeply touched by your gracious words of introduction. Thank you. Having accepted Professor Jayavira's invitation to be the chief guest at this inauguration, I was thinking about what I should say. And I found that I was taking a sentimental journey from the establishment of PEMSA in 1992 to this wonderful evening. 
Some of you will recognize this melody from the 1940s hit song by Doris Day, A Sentimental Journey. Gonna take a sentimental journey. Gonna set my heart at ease. Gonna make a sentimental journey to renew all memories. My journey with PEMSA has been one with interesting and educative experiences dotted with anecdotal events, a few of which I thought I will share with you. The first PEMSA Congress was planned with much vigor. Being the wife of an alumnus of the first batch, my first assignment for PEMSA was to organize the drummers and the dancers for the inauguration procession. I remember with gratitude the late Professor S. B. Ellapala, who very kindly organized the Dalada Maligave Heavy Sea Dance Troupe and helped me out. The honor of delivering the first inaugural Congress lecture was afforded to Channa, my husband. It was indeed a proud moment. The first academic sessions were held at the Hotel Tormali, and there was this souvenir stall in the hotel lobby. It was a beautiful place, this lobby, lit by warm sunlight, cool and windy, surrounded by the hills of candy. Now, the souvenir stall was managed by the Mu senior wives of the doctors of the first batch. In addition to various souvenirs, a limited number of specially minted gold coins, caught sovereign, I think, were on sale. My task was to stay outside the stall and encourage customers. Suddenly, I spotted one of my professors of anatomy, now passed on, bless her soul, walking in briskly, petite, and neatly clad, as always, in a beautiful cotton sari of a pastel shade. My enthusiastic sales talk was turned down with the curt reminder that I should be participating in the academic sessions and not selling souvenirs in the hotel lobby. I was somewhat deflated, but actually it got me thinking about my academic career, which up until then was furthest from my mind. Oh, but that lobby. I was drawn to it like a magnet. This was the meeting place for all who had traveled to Kandy from all parts of the world. And it gave me a front seat view of the camaraderie amongst the alumni who were meeting perhaps for the first time since leaving the faculty. There were hugs and kisses, exclamations and laughter, and I'm sure reminiscences of past romances. The atmosphere was electric and infectious. I think it is this memory, still very vivid, that has kept me so attached to PEMSA from its inception to date. The second Congress was organized by the third and fourth batches. I was not involved. Happening to visit one of my clinical teachers warded in the then cardiology unit in Kandy, I offered my help to his wife, who was also one of my professors. What I really meant was that I could bring a little lunch or dinner for the patient. She, being in charge of the scientific session of this Congress, immediately took up my offer and handed over the entire file of the Congress to me, saying due to personal reasons, she had to leave the country in the next few days and would not be able to attend the event, and I could take over the task. She assured me that all the speakers and topics were finalized and confirmed. Actually, I was so naive that I took the file without fear. The Congress committee was not amused. After all, I was only an alumnus of the 12th batch. All speakers, when contacted by landline or letter, were well aware of the date and time of their presentations. Mind you, there were no mobile phones or email in that time. The sessions went off without a hitch, thanks to my professor's meticulous planning and documentation, which enabled a novice like me to take over. I had no official status in that Congress, but my name appeared as co-editor in the Book of Proceedings, and this came in useful to me 
at a later date. Several years later, being in charge of the scientific program of the 8th Congress, as usual, each speaker was sent a letter by registered mail with details, as email and mobile phones were still not in vogue. Three weeks before the Congress on double checking, it became clear that no one had received these letters. As usual, the postal department was duly blamed. But the Congress chairman, he is here today, a senior professor and a seasoned administrator soon ferreted out from the office assistant, a young lad who was the son of a retired faculty driver, that the money given for registration was used by him and the letters were not posted. We found them letters in the desk drawer in the office. I now realize with gratitude that these professors taught me much more than subjects in medicine in their own experienced way. 2012 was the 50th jubilee of the faculty and the year for the 11th Congress. I was the president PEMSA and was absolutely privileged to have had in the Congress committee Chandra Besekar as Congress chairperson, Eshan Jaivir as Congress secretary, Vasanti Pinto as PEMSA secretary, Sujata Vattagaba, PEMSA treasurer, along with many others. They were the dream team. My passion during my presidency was to establish a studentship in the faculty like a mini Mahapola, I dreamt, the PEMSA studentship. We were generating funds. At this time, I place on record with gratitude the remarkable response from our Vice Chancellor, Professor Imdi Lamavansa, not here today, who made the first personal contribution. PEMSA Australasia for their two large contributions. PEMSA USA for selling a remarkable number of the famous Jubilee volume, the money which was all for the studentship. PEMSA UK for their contributions. The three editors of the anniversary volume, the late Professor T. Varguna, Professor Manel Vijay Sundara, and Professor Chana Ratnatunga, who donated all the profits from this book to the studentship. And Chandra Abesekar and Shantini Rosairo for donating profits of the 12th Congress towards this endeavor. PEMSA has grown in leaps and bounds with very active branches in four countries, USA, Australia, UK, and Bhutan. And today, Krish, I'm so proud to be on the same stage as you from PEMSA UK, which is now a proactive organization playing a major role in PEMSA activities. I know you have been the live buyer of this rejuvenation. Today, PEMSA is much more than one which organizes an international congress every two years. It has become a rock for the faculty and its students and alumni enabling many benefits for them and also to the community. I express my deep admiration to the current president, Pemsa Tushara, and his committee, and the Dean Medicine, Vasanti, for their valiant effort, efforts during these past troubled times. I congratulate the chairman and the committee of the 16th International Medical Congress for selecting the very topical theme delivering holistic patient care amidst challenges. I am sure it will be a resounding success. Today is a very special day, and this sentimental journey goes back to the wonderful halcyon days at Peradenia in the late 70s, early 80s, way before PEMSA was started. When I was but a finally a medico and thereafter a raw young lecturer, and came our dean and colleagues, bright, mischievous, playful medical students. Kemal, I'm so proud to be the chief guest at this Congress, where you will be delivering the prestigious Congress lecture, an honor like no other. I extend my heartiest congratulations to you. You have made Peradenia proud as an outstanding academic and a caring human being. To conclude, I quote these lines from the last verse of the school anthem of a school in Kandy, the beautiful words of which are most appropriate for all of us and our medical school also, and I'm sure will bring nostalgic memories to many here. I quote, 
we will honor yet the school we knew, the best school of all. We will honor yet the rule we knew, till the last bell call. For working days or holidays, and glad or melancholy days, they were great days and jolly days at the best school of all. Professor Heshan Javira, what a coincidence that you were the Congress Secretary of the 11th Congress when I was PEMSA President, and today you are the 16th Congress Chairman. I am so happy and proud to be the chief guest at its inauguration this evening. I thank you and the Congress Committee for affording me this honor. It has enabled me to take this sentimental journey, which otherwise I would not have done. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, for those wonderful words, which remind us of your beloved lectures and took us down memory lane. You continue to be a huge source of inspiration to all of us. And now, I would like to invite the Dean, Faculty of Medicine, Professor Vasanthi Pinto, to hand over a token of appreciation to convey our gratitude and respect. Thank you. Uh, it has been the custom for PEMSA to recognize and appreciate both the academic staff and the extended staff members who contribute to undergraduate teaching and also to recognize the academic achievers who have brought honor to the faculty. Tonight, we are felicitating and honoring such achievers for this year. Thank you all for accepting the invitation of PEMSA and being here with us tonight. May I invite the brilliant and hardworking Congress Secretary, Dr. Chatrika Dandanya, to read the citations. Good evening to you all. PEMSA has always strived to pay tribute to those who richly deserve it. As such, felicitation of teachers who have made immense contribution to teaching and training of medical undergraduates and postgraduates has been a long-term tradition that we have followed. It is now time to take this tradition forward. Tonight, we will be felicitating 19 teachers affiliated to the Faculty of Medicine, University of Peradeniya, and the teaching hospitals of Peradeniya and Kandy. These teachers are known to you all and need no introductions. Many of us in the audience have been their students at one time or another. When presenting them forth, it is really difficult to do justice to their extensive CVs within a limited period of time. However, reminding you all of the common denominator for all of them, the immense service they have done to the field of medical education, uh, to the community, and to the fields of research and academia, we have chosen a few highlights unique to them and their extensive careers to place before you. I would very kindly invite the chief guest, Professor Nilakanti Ratnatunga, and the president of the PEMSA, Professor Tushar Kudagamana, to come in front of the stage to give away the tokens of appreciation, and would also request the teacher concerned to please come in front and stand along with them while their citation is being read out. Professor Ananda Jayasingha, MBBS, DCH London, MRCP Pediatrics, FRCP, 
MSc, FRCPCH. Having entered the Faculty of Medicine, University of Peradeniya in 1978, he later joined his alma mater as an academic member. Professor Jayasinghe served as a professor in community medicine and is a former head of the Department of Community Medicine. He is a certified pediatrician in the UK and served as a community pediatrician in the West Wales General Hospital from 2004 to 2005. He has several scientific publications to his name and has received five presidential awards, one merit award from the National Science Foundation and delivered the KSM oration on prevention of rabies in 2003. He has conducted collaborative research with the Faculty of Medicine, University of Cardiff, and with uh, the Graduate School of Medicine of University of Hokkaido, Japan. Through this work, many postgraduate trainees benefited immensely. Mr. President, members of the Council, and distinguished guests, may I present Professor Ananda Jayasinghe for felicitation by PEMSA. Professor Palle Godavitanage Ranjit Kumar Siri, MBBS, MSc, MD. He entered the Faculty of Medicine of University of Peradeni in the batch of 1976. In 1986, he completed an MSc in Community Medicine and started on his MD training, and later embarked on his overseas training at the University of Yokohama in Japan, where he specialized in epidemiology and medical statistics. In 1996, leaving the Ministry of Health, he joined the Department of Community Medicine at Peradeniya. He was instrumental in developing the Communication, Learning and Research, the CLR stream module in beyond 2004 medical curriculum and acted as its convener until 2021. He has an extensive research career, in, uh, career and the recipient of numerous awards. Currently, his H index stands at 20. As the chairperson of the Ethics Review Committee of the Faculty of Medicine, he led the committee to achieve the remarkable feat of upgrading the ERC to receive the CIDES recognition. He is also a past president of the PEMSA. Dear President, members of the Council, and distinguished guests, may I present Professor Pivya Kumarasiri for felicitation tonight. Dr. Devani Disanayaka, MBBS, MSc, MD. She is a proud product of Maliadeva Balika Vidyale Kurunagala, where she received the medal for the best all rounder. Having entered the Faculty of Medicine uh, at University of Peradeni in 1985, Dr. Disanayaka had an illustrious undergraduate career, receiving classes in all undergraduate exams that she faced. She joined the Department of Community Medicine in 1997, and she later completed her MSc and MD in Community Medicine in 2006. Beyond undergraduate and postgraduate teaching and training, she rendered her immeasurable services to the faculty through her untiring work as the coordinator of the Curriculum Coordination Committee and the Monitoring and Evaluation Committee. She was the convener for the Doctrine Society stream of the Beyond 2004 Medical Curriculum for 15 years. She has a commendable research career with over 45 research papers in peer-reviewed journals. She was always a well sought after research supervisor. Her students always excelling in research and winning many awards, the essence of a true teacher. Dear President, members of the Council and distinguished guests, may I present Dr. Devani Disanayaka for felicitation by our esteemed organization. Dr. Lakshman Vatavana, MBBS, MSc, PhD. He entered the University of Colombo from Mahinda Vidyale in Gaul in 1976. Following the completion of internship and working in the National Blood Transfusion Service, he joined the Nuclear Medicine Unit of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Peradeniya, in 1984. He later did his MSc in Nuclear Medicine at St. Bartholomew's University Hospital in London, UK, and later his PhD at SN Medical College at Agra, India. He worked tirelessly with international bodies in nuclear medicine to develop the nuclear medicine unit by acquiring infrastructure and training staff 
and he was the head of the unit from 1991 to 2005, a remarkable feat. He also has extensive experience in teaching as well as research. Dear President, members of the Council and distinguished guests, may I present Dr. Lakshman Matavana for felicitation by our esteemed organization. Dr. Sisira Kumara Ranaraja, MBBS, MS in OBS and Gaini, FSLCOG, FRCOG UK. Graduated in 1985 from the University of Peradeniya. He obtained his MS in OBS and Jin from University of Colombo in 1991 and the MRCOG in 1997. He was awarded the fellowship from Sri Lanka College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in 2011. He rendered his services as a consultant in obstetrics and gynecology across the country, having worked in GH Anuradhapura, teaching hospital Kegol, National Hospital Kandy, and finally teaching hospital Peradeniya, from where he retired in 2021. Throughout his career, he contributed untiringly to undergraduate and postgraduate teaching and training. Dear President, members of the Council, and distinguished guests, May I present Dr. S. K. Ranaraja for felicitating, felicitation by our esteemed organization. <laughs> Dr. S. Selvaratnam, MBBS, MS. Dr. Sina Durai Selvaratnam hails from Mulatev and graduated from the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Jaffna in 1984. Following graduation, he literally crossed the country and settled in Gaul, where he worked for the next 12 years in various positions in teaching hospital Karapitiya until commencement of his postgraduate studies. In 2001, he obtained his postgraduate qualifications in otolaryngology and head and neck surgery. After serving in various hospitals, he was appointed as the consultant ENT surgeon at TH Candy in 2006, where he served until his retirement. He engaged in teaching medical undergraduates in the University of Ruhuna during his tenure at Karapitiya and continued the same at TH Candy. Mild-mannered, silent, yet kind and enthusiastic, Dr. Selratnam has always been loved by undergraduate and postgraduate students alike. Dear President, members of the Council, and distinguished guests, may I present Dr. S. Selvaratnam for felicitation tonight. <laughs> Dr. W. K. S. Kularatna, MPPS, MD, MRCP UK, FRCP London, and FCCP. He obtained his primary medical qualification from the University of Peradeniya and later completed his MD in medicine and obtained board certification as a consultant in internal medicine in 1991. Since then, he has proved, uh, provided commendable service to the public of the country. A multifaceted person, he has published more than 25 papers and has received President's Award on two occasions for his research papers. He has authored book chapters to share his wide and varied experience with the medical community. He has been a teacher for future doctors in the faculties of medicine of Rajarata and Peradeniya and has been a sought after postgraduate trainer. He has served as examiner for many exams including MBBS, MD as well as MRCP PACES. Following a brilliant career as a consultant for 32 years, he retired from the National Hospital of Kandy in December 2022. Dear President, members of the Council, and distinguished guests, may I present Dr. W. K. S. Kularadna for felicitation on this occasion. <laughs> Dr. S. P. Eknaika, MBBS, MS, OBS, and Jin. Entered the University of Peradeniya from Senapura and Radhapura in 1980. Following the second MBBS examination, he moved to the then new University of Ruhuna to complete his medical degree in 1986. Having completed his postgraduate exams in 1996, he later received overseas training at Wrexham Miller Hospital, UK. Following his return, Dr. Ekanayaka served the populace across the country working in hospitals like Balangoda, 
Ampara, Anuradhapura, Matale, and Kurunagala. He assumed duty at National Hospital Kandy in 2015, where he worked until his retirement, rendering services as a clinician, as well as an undergraduate and postgraduate teacher. Dear President, members of the Council, and distinguished guests, may I present Dr. S. P. Ekanayaka for felicitation by our esteemed organization. Dr. E. A. D. Udaya Kumara, MBBS, MS, FRCS, FCSSL. Graduated from the University of Colombo in the batch of 1979. Having completed his postgraduate studies in surgery in 2000, he pursued his overseas training at Royal Adelaide and La McEwen Hospitals in Southern Australia. He has worked closely with the College of Surgeons of Sri Lanka to spread surgical trainings and skills to the periphery conducting many seminars and workshops targeting peripheral surgeons. During his tenures in several teaching hospitals, the last being National Hospital of Kandy from where he retired, he has worked tirelessly to teach and train future generations of medical students and postgraduate trainees. Dear President, members of the Council and distinguished guests, may I present Dr. E. A. D. Uday Kumar for felicitation today. Dr. Gamini Virakon, MD, FCCP, is an old boy of Vidyata College, Kandy. He passed out from the Faculty of Medicine, University of Peradeniya in 1986. Pursuing a postgraduate career in medicine, he completed his MD in 1995 and selected cardiology for post-MD training in Sri Lanka. His overseas training was as an interventional cardiology fellow at Alfred Hospital, Melbourne, Australia, and he was board certified as a specialist in cardiology in 1999. Having su served in Badulla, National Hospital of Sri Lanka, and then later Kurunagala, he returned to National Hospital Kandy for the second time in 2014, where he served to save lives and enlighten medical undergraduates and postgraduates until his retirement in, in 2021. Dear President, members of the Council, and distinguished guests, may I present Dr. Gamini Virakorn for felicitation. Dr. S. M. M. Niaz, MBBS, MS, FRCS England, FRCS Edinburgh. Dr. Syed Muhammad Muhammad Niaz from Akurana Kandy entered the Faculty of Medicine of University of Peradeniya in the batch of 1979. Later, he started on his postgraduate studies in surgery under the tutelage of many eminent surgeons, including Professor Arjun Aluvihare and Professor Channa Ratnadunga. He worked in the Portsmouth NHS Trust to complete his overseas training and obtain FRCS England and Edinburgh. And upon his return, he rendered his services to different communities across the country until he assumed his last appointment at National Hospital of Kandy in 2008, where he worked until, reti until his retirement in 2023. In addition to his tireless efforts in teaching and training countless batches of undergraduates and postgraduates, Dr. Niaz is known for his enthusiasm in developing the infrastructure in any station that he has served. He was the vice president of PEMSA in 2010 to 2012, and the president of the Kandy Society of Medicine in 2018-19, and is the president-elect of the College of Surgeons of Sri Lanka for 2024. Dear President, members of the Council, and distinguished guests, I take great pride in presenting Dr. S. M. M. Niaz for felicitation by our esteemed organization. <laughs> Dr. Damianta Baminiwata, MBBS, MS Ophthalmology, FRCS. Entered the Faculty of Medicine, University of Peradeniya, in 1978. Her desire to pursue ophthalmology saw her taking up the position of a medical officer in the eye unit at the uh, teaching hospital in Kandy in 1987. While here, she completed the diploma in ophthalmology, and after a few years of serving in the peripheries, as was required by the ministry at the time, 
She completed later the MS in ophthalmology in 2000. During her years in the peripheries, she strived to carry out many community projects in high health. She completed her offshore assi assignment at the Mayday University Hospital London, UK, and successfully obtained her FRCS. On her return to Sri Lanka, she was posted to the District General Hospital Ampara, where she continued her community services, reaching to far nooks and corners of the province through eye camps. After several subsequent appointments, she was transferred to National Hospital Kandy in 2013 as a consultant eye surgeon. She served in the Council of the College of Ophthalmologists since 2008 and was the president of the college in 2015. She was also a postgraduate trainer and an examiner in ophthalmology and was a member of the Board of Study in Ophthalmology. Dear President, members of the Council and distinguished guests, I take pride in presenting Dr. Damyanta Bhaminivatta for felicitation by our esteemed organization. Thank you very much for handing out the plaques of felicitation to the teachers, dear madam and sir. There are some more teachers who were recognized to be felicitated but who unfortunately found it difficult to be with us today physically. They will be felicitated in absentia after the Congress lecture. The next set of awards goes, go to the proud products of our alma mater. It is time for the student awards. May I cordially invite our guest of honor, Dr. Krish Radhakrishnan, and the Congress chairperson, Professor Heshan Jayavira, to give away the awards. The PEMSA medal for the best performance at final MBBS and the special award for achieving a high merit position at the final MBBS examination 2021 goes to Dr. E. P. M. W. Karunathilaka from the batch of 2013. The PEMSA medal for the best performance at final MBBS 2022 goes to Dr. R. Danushka from the batch of 2014. PEMSA Special Award for Achieving a High Merit Position at Final MBBS Examination 2022 goes to Dr. P. G. J. A. V. Rakwadi from the Batch of 2014. PEMSA Prize for Undergraduate Research 2022 is awarded to Neelavathura NWTSK et al. for the research presentation on problems and symptoms related to menstruation and its impact on the daily routine of medical undergraduates of the University of Peradeniya at the Peradeniya Medical School Annual Research Conference 2022. Thank you very much, sir, and thank you to all. Thank you, madam. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the most awaited event of the night, the renowned Congress Lecture. To introduce tonight's distinguished guest, to whom this honor has befallen, I invite the Congress Chair, Professor Heshan Jaivira, 
to introduce Professor Kemal D. Distinguished members of the head table, distinguished invitees, ladies and gentlemen, it is now my pleasure to introduce to you the Congress lecturer of the 16th International Medical Congress of PEMSA, an outstanding alumnus of Peradenia, Professor Emeritus, Professor Kemal Dean. Young Kemal Dean was raised in Kandy, and he had his primary and secondary education at Trinity College, where he also excelled in rugby football. He qualified MBBS with second class honors from Peradenia, and also won the award for the Outstanding Sportsman of University of Peradenia. He had his postgraduate training in surgery in Sri Lanka, Birmingham, UK, and Minnesota, USA, and was awarded University of Minnesota's Outstanding Surgical Resident Award. His postgraduate qualifications include an MS from University of Colombo, a MD from the University of Birmingham, and he was also elected a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons, Glasgow. He was the founder, presider, uh, founder professor at the University of Kalania and retired as a senior professor and chair in surgery. As a clinician and teacher, he worked mainly in the treatment of patients with colorectal disease, taught undergraduates and postgraduate surgical trainees for over 20 years in university practice. As a researcher, his focus was in areas of anal sphincter structure and function, improving the functional outcomes of surgery for rectal cancer and colitis and restoration of continence. He has, to his credit, over 130 peer-reviewed papers, 35 book chapters with an H index of 29, and has delivered over 400 invited talks. He is a past president of the College of Surgeons, Sri Lanka, the Sri Lanka Society of Gastroenterology, and the Asian Society of Stoma Rehabilitation. And he is also the editor-in-chief of the Sri Lanka Journal of Surgery. Professor Dean has been a visiting professor of several universities overseas and served in many pioneering ventures in Sri Lanka, most notably development of stoma nursing, the development and launch of Sri Lanka's nanosatellites during his term as the chairman at the Arthur C. Clarke Center and in the formation of the Moratua University Medical School. Professor Dean, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and being here tonight as the Congress lecturer. We are honored to have you here and we are truly looking forward to hearing you. Let me now invite President Pemsa, Professor Tushara Kudagamana, to award the medal to the Congress lecturer, Professor Kemal Dean. And then I would like to call upon Professor Kemal Dean to deliver the Congress lecture. Thank you, Professor Kutagamana. And may I kindly request the dignitaries in the head table to take their seats in the audience. Over to you, sir.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is a superlative honor to be uh, having asked by the Council of the Paradeni Medical uh, School and Students Alumni Association uh, to deliver this talk to you tonight. I know the night is a long uh, night, and I thank uh, both the president of the council and as well as PEMSA, um, my teachers, the chief guest, uh, Professor Neela Kandiratnathunga and uh, Chris for having made all the way from the UK and, la and all of you ladies and gentlemen here tonight. Uh, to take off from where Professor Ratnathunga left in terms of sharing sentiment, I know the night is long, but allow me to share a minute with you uh, about the sentiments that we all would have had on the first day of medical school. It would be uh, just under 45 years when I entered the medical school at Peradenia, a very proud place to be. I was received at the front gate by a senior member uh, of the senior batch, who is now a member of your council, by the way. I shall not name him. And he led me on, not to the medical school, he led me on to the post office uh, that lay on the other side of the Galaha Road. And he took me in there, he bade me to a corner, and he gave me a, a white flower. And he said, can you smell this? And I, and I smelled it and he said, do you recognize the order? Uh, and that felt like the order of a specific body fluid. And I said, yes, uh, in Sinhalese. And he said, good, you have passed test number one. Uh, from that moment onwards, in keeping with your, uh, uh, your meetings uh, uh, a day age, uh, I have uh, been uh, requiring holistic care um, is a huge challenge, and uh, he rendered me differently abled from there on. He then, the next question before I got sent off was, what is this tube that lines uh, the chest that delivers food from the mouth of the gullet? And uh, I hesitated a bit, and I said, esophagus, and he said, run off, uh, in the choicest singular language, which I understood, obviously. And I swore to myself that I would never be a specialist in uh, surgery of the esophagus. In fact, I ch chose the southernmost part of the intestinal tract to become a specialist in. And so, whether he knows it or not, I'm delivering and announcing you to you today. That's the whole reason why I ended up being a colorectal surgeon. It's been three decades of battling rectal cancer. And the title, The Good, Bad, and the Ugly, arises from a long and arduous battle that this gentleman on your left-hand side, uh, Clint Eastwood, who ran in this film, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly in 1966. Some of you younger colleagues may not uh, uh, recognize him or the film, but certainly recommend you watch it because this is a timely classic, never will go out of function. And then I met Professor Ratnatunga, my teacher, right in the lobby here today, and he mentions, uh, the word, obviously he's still, he, you understand his youth, and he said, uh, Clint Eastwood said, never let the old man get into you. And that's exactly what it is. So Clint Eastwood has two uh, important things today. He is the source of the title of my talk, and he also uh, delivers a message for the, yeah, for the older people, like some of us and older than us, uh, to understand that youth never dies. Um, so the talk about rectal cancer is a huge one because it affects Sri Lanka in more than one way. It is the second most common cancer in, in women. It's the second, third most con common cancer in men. Overall, for both genders, it's the second most common cancer. 50% of people who are diagnosed with colorectal cancer, specifically rectal cancer, will only be alive in five years, the others won't be around. It's a huge problem for a cancer that is totally preventable. There is a five-year period between the onset of what is called a polyp, which is a completely benign asymptomatic lesion in the colon that uh, develops over a period of time, just like cervical cancer, to become the, become the cancer and the nasty dis destroyer of human life and family that it has done so far, and we haven't despite all the troubles, gotten over this. So it doesn't matter to me, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen, whether you work in Sri Lanka, or whether you're in the best 
possible places in the United States of America, it still is a challenge. It doesn't matter where you come from. And, I'm, and my, my research and my talk will tell you this. I think if we uh, understand that, then we can do good quality research in this part of the world. There are parts of the world that are developed where research is not possible because society has prevented them from undertaking uh, dangerous parts of uh, cutting edge research purely because they have, if you like, become sissies. Uh, don't allow people to operate on, uh, on animals and dogs anymore, but we are very quick to export monkeys. Uh, so, so you understand the bigotry that happens in the world, but I have to tell you that all of that, including the experiences that we've gained from the world wars and including our war, have allowed us to uh, improve and, uh, and gain further knowledge into insights of how we can improve and move on with the treatments of what we deal with. This is a paper from the University of Colombo, Professor uh, Samra Sekar's unit uh, is talking about a 10-year history of evaluating patients with colorectal cancer. They went into the Maharagama or the National Cancer Institute's uh, database and just be watched the, 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 the uh, highlighted areas in red circles. It has increased over 10 years, colorectal cancer, I mean. Hasten to add that rectal cancer is two-thirds of all colorectal cancer, and greater in females, the rising rate in females. So I suggest that female colleagues, watch out. Your patients are not any less immune from colorectal cancer than your male counterparts. These are uh, the data from the recent uh, NCCI uh, uh, ratings that uh, shows that S Sri Lanka's colorectal cancer problem is now the third most common in the world or in Sri Lanka and its incidence is on the rise by the way. Data from our unit, Professor Pramod Chandra Singer who's now a professor in surgery and uh, uh, holds uh, the colorectal uh, surgical research position there, uh, looked at patients uh, 679 over 18 year period and found the majority of cancers in the large intestine were confined to the left colon and most of these left colon cancers were confined to the rectum. So I have this rule of two thirds. Two thirds of all bowel cancers, large bowel cancers are in the left side of the colon. And of these two thirds in the left side of the colon, the majority, over 66%, are in the rectum, within the reach of the finger that uh, most of us fail to introduce through the anal canal in our busyness of practice, a simple but formidable evaluation. So in currently, colorectal cancer is number three spot in Sri Lankan cancer statistics, up from being the seventh in 2008. So in a, in a sense, we have failed. In 2008, the seventh mo most common cancer, the most preventable cancer, is now third in Sri Lankan rating. So uh, there lies a message. And so there is a cry for help. It is the third most common cancer in Sri Lanka. Over 60% of all blood bowel cancers are in the rectum. Females, beware, this is a cancer that has no gender bias. It affects men as well as women. And uh, there is no... Um, postulated theory that hormonal cycles protect you from uh, colorectal cancer. It happens, my, my youngest patient was a female lactating mother, 25 years old, a teacher who presented six months ago with rectal bleeding, who I thought had piles. I'd set her up to do a flexible sigmoidoscopy and manage her piles. Lo and behold, she had a rectal cancer. So please beware. 30% of young people with colorectal cancer, or 30% of all people are young with colorectal cancer. So rectal bleeding is not piles anymore until proven otherwise. And the only way we can prove it is entering the colon through an endoscope and examining it, not by barium exams. Yet, it's the most preventable cancer in the world. So it's unbelievable that we ignore such events. I think our colleagues in cervical cancer have made the grade, but we have failed to. I like to produce this picture 
in order to be able to describe for those uninitiated the origins of colorectal cancer, and that's a beehive there, centered somewhere in that beehive is this queen bee that everyone, every bee looks after. And that's exactly what the intestinal crypt is. If you look on the left-hand side, you see the orange and the blue uh, cellular structures that are depicted, uh, and that's where the colonic stem cell is. Each crypt has a totipotent cell that is the producer of colonocytes. And as they progress on, the colonocytes are pushed up and up until they become the mature colonocytes, which are the green. And every three to five days, these green cells are programmed to undergo a process called suicide, which is apoptosis that we call it in medical terms. And it is all genetically managed. It's amazing, isn't it, how creation has given us the ability uh, to shed away the cells that are continuously exposed to carcinogens, bile acids, and have the ability to change to cancer, they get shed in five days. And then on comes a new set of cells. I mean, if, if people don't believe that there is some, some, some power above us, uh, here's an example. We, as human beings, I think, are too big-headed to understand that there is no power mightier than us. And I uh, choose to differ in my experiences and my everyday life uh, of treating patients. So all of this is programmed. If you look on the right side, somehow or the other, there are, there are genes that are called tumor suppressor genes. And these tumor suppressor genes are there to protect genetic aberrations that may produce cancer. And these tumor suppressor genes, even if the cancer gene has been introduced, they can suppress that tumor uh, producing a gene to produce the good gene. And if that does not happen, then apoptosis or suicide does not happen. The cells start mounting on each other, which is what you see on the green side. That is the start to development of what is called a colonic polyp. On the top half of this picture, you will see the progression from initially a whole few cells heaping up to become a small polyp and a large polyp. And from the polyp to the right extreme of your picture where you see the white invasion, which is the full-blown cancer, and that polyp to dysplasia to cancer sequence happens over a period of five years, perhaps younger in younger people, but generally five years. So we have a five-year window in each of us that enables us to undergo colonoscopy, detect the polyp, and to have it removed. The reason why people don't have colonoscopy is because there are no symptoms, and they think this doctor is talking nonsense. Um, I don't have symptoms. Why are they asking me to do this? So if you look at the specimen down there, there's a polyp on the left-hand extreme, asymptomatic. It grows bigger to the second polyp. Again, dysplastic, no, no bleeding. Maybe if you do fecal occult blood testing, you might pick up uh, a positive test that might trigger your requirement for colonoscopy, but most people don't do fecal occult blood testing, and this is a cry out to the general practitioners in this audience. Please do FOBs in patients over 45 years regular, just like cervical screening is done. And once, of course, it becomes a cancer, we are talking a different ball game. We are talking about treatment of established cancer. We are talking about establishment of um, social relationships with one's patient because cancer equals death. Uh, until proven otherwise, and there's a huge different plan and proposal from the doctor to the, uh, and the treating team to this patient. So uh, it, it's a disaster waiting to happen. And that disaster is made worse if it happens in the rectum. The rectum is beautifully cajoled and protected by this bony pelvis. It, access is terribly difficult. Uh, the only points of access are through the pelvic inlet, and it looks easy here because it's an empty pelvis, but add to that uh, 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 uterus with fibroids in it, uh, add to that uh, uh, a male pelvis, which is narrow, add to that an elderly male urinary bladder which has blood outflow obstruction and is enlarged, you don't have space. Uh, fortunately, we had laparoscopy that came in at least 25 years ago. We can now access the depths of the pelvis using slim instruments, 
uh, not breaking our backs watching over a screen. So this has been a distinct advantage in the management of rectal cancer in the last two decades. Um, we have that here in Sri Lanka, but it's taken a bit of time, but certainly we have some excellent training programs here within the surgical disciplines of gastrointestinal surgery and colorectal surgery within uh, our Sri Lankan context. Um, as I said, if that red dot or the image is to depict your cancer, that is a relative routine rectal cancer operation for people trained in the process of rectal cancer. But if you push it down, now you're in trouble because you have access problems. You have, what I haven't told you right now, is the ureters, both sides. You have pelvic nerves that go to provide sexual function, healthy sexual function in patients. Uh, and you have the sphincters that prevent you from going from the south end of the pelvis to attack this rectal cancer. So therein lies the problem and therein has been my area of, uh, of research and specialization. How do we get to that rectal cancer right at the bottom of the rectum that will enable us to restore intestinal continuity in our patients? As you know, the treatment for those, or has been since the turn of the 19th or the 20th century, has been a mutilating operation called abdominal perineal resection, which we still tend to do sometimes, but less so now. Uh, the problems of abdominal perineal resection, I happen to see as a young intern on the, on the ward of the Prof. Unit in Peridania with Prof. Aluvihari and uh, the late Dr. Budpitya, bless him. Uh, I am ever so grateful for his, uh, uh, his instruction and his, his teaching that he didn't realize he taught us. Uh, but therein left a peri perineum that was uh, similar to what we saw in bomb-blasted young people. Uh, and the patient ended up with a colostomy. At that time, uh, in the 1980s, we had uh, very few appliances that uh, provided patients with a sense of social hygiene and decency, and most of these patients had no education about stoma care. They were, the operation was a success. That was all the end goal of the patient and the, and, the, and the surgical team. The patient went home far and wide, and that led to social ostracization and uh, dim diminution in their quality of life. This is a study from Michael, S Michael Silva when he was with us. Uh, essentially, uh, what we did was ran that paper through uh, what is called a, 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 an IT program that does produce what is called a word echo, and you will see that a lot of these words relating, relating to ileostomy and colostomy are negative. So that's, that's the kind of uh, impact that patients uh, are put through and the uh, stomas have on patients. Of course, the quest of continence, um, I halt for a minute to say that the astute medical student, Pere Denier, uh, did not only learn uh, the syllabuses and the syllabi. We learned from the pearls that dropped off our pa pa uh, teachers, parents, I was going to say, our teachers. And if you learn from those pearls, then you picked up a lot more than medical education. And some of the pearls I picked up was in this place. We all know uh, this is the dissecting room of the teaching hospital uh, or, or the medical school at Peradenia. We knew who frequented these places. And one of them was this lady, the lady who would be crisp white, dressed in cotton dress. She often walked across the, uh, the floor with her left hand just lifting her sari right up above the floor uh, as if to say, look, don't mess with me, boy. I'm smaller than you, but listen to what I say. And one of the things that she said in the first week of medical school is in order to be able to excel as a person who treats disease, you absolutely know what, need to know what the normal is. That message ran home deep in my mind, and that's exactly what I did for a few years. In order to be able to understand what I did, you need to also understand that the treatment of rectal cancer has two huge problems. One's if you fix it, there's a huge problem about continence. If you have a colostomy, it's not continent. If you plug it to the bottom and restore continence, 
then the patient's sphincters are probably not going to work so well because we didn't understand sphincters then. And then, of course, if you do, didn't do uh, an operation that resected it with a curative margin, you had local recurrence. And local recurrence in rectal cancer in the pelvis is bad news because the patient's now going to have no surgery or completely mutilating exenteration surgery where we remove the urinary bladder, rectum, and everything inside and give them two stomas, and that's the end of their world. Um, so uh, from 1999, 91 to 94, I spent three years uh, as part of an MD research program at the University of Birmingham uh, studying the anal sphincters. And you understand just from the diagram what, it, what we mean by saying it's an anal sphincter complex. Uh, I was very enthusiastic when I was an intern asking Professor Aluvihari about how he assessed the sphincters because he had done some work uh, on anal sphincters when he was at St. Mark's Hospital and said, looked at me and said, we insert needles in there and we looked at electrical signals and I didn't know what these needles meant but now I know it's uh, electromyography and previously people had a problem finding out the, the structure of the sphincters because there was no imaging. All they had to do is uh, push needles into different parts of the circumference of the perineum and understand that through EMG you could map the presence or absence of sphincter. That made sense, but it did not make sense when you want to reconstruct it. So my research in ultrasound was led by two uh, genius of, uh, uh, of surgeons here at the bottom. On the left is Professor Michael Keithley, who uh, was a world-class expert in, um, in continents, and the right was John Alexander Williams. Uh, at that time, the University of Birmingham and the Queen Elizabeth Hospital was probably the place in England to, to work in to understand, better understand inflammatory bowel disease, uh, continent sphincters, and rectal cancer. And as an MRC fellow, I got given that instruments, the Bruin, Bruin Care Endo Ultrasound Equipment with uh, two probes and said, this is for you not to be used on human beings. Go away, spend the next six months uh, telling me what you have learned about all of the research in anal sphincters and tell me how you can use this to uh, deliver a better understanding of the structure of the anal sphincters. And you wouldn't believe it, but most of my life in the six months was spent in the mortuary because of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital because we had to study fresh cadavers. It was no good going to a cadaveric dissecting room because they had changed, the morphology had changed, the anatomy, it was all post-mortem. Uh, uh, data that we were getting, we did that, but we couldn't get any far. We were required to, I was required to give information on human, live humans, and so the best was to do a cadaver within 12 hours, and that required a lot of logistic support. Uh, ever so grateful to the people in that, uh, uh, in that postmodern room who supported me on that work. And we came out with this prop image. It's the endoanal ultrasound of the internal and the external sphincter. You see the hypoechoic ring, the black ring, which is the internal anal sphincter. It's an involuntary sphincter that keeps you continent when you're asleep at night time. And then you have the mixed echogenic or the white ring around that pretty picture uh, of the external anal sphincter. Once I had done that, uh, Professor Keatley said, now go away, look at all my patients who've had sphincter injuries because that Birmingham was a cent for uh, dealing with incontinence following obstetric trauma. And there were many ladies who had had nasty deliveries, perineal tears, um, forceps assisted deliveries who become incontinent because they had torn their sphincter. And armed with the knowledge of what the normal sphincter is, remember Professor e. G. Eugene Vikram Nayaka, we studied the uh, anal sphincter in these patients and we found, oh, there's, there's the image of the internal sphincter ruptured across one half of the circumference marked by the arrows and that produced uh, uh, data to produce the world's first ever endosonographic image of the correlation between uh, anal sphincters, incontinence and sphincter disruption. All of the work that happened and happens today from anal sphincter uh, structure and uh, evaluation stems from this initial work from us in Birmingham. Um, that was not good enough for me because if I thought I was going to go somehow or the other, most people thought I was going to stay back, 
I had a different mission in mind. I was going to come back home one day, come what may. And I realized that if you, uh, in the process of damage or, or, or removing these difficult sphincters right at the bottom, if you damaged it, how did you repair it? If you had a neuropathic sphincter, there's no going point having a sphincter there. We need to replace this. And at the time, uh, the University of Minnesota and the Mayo Medical School had advertised for a fellow to work in their research program to, to develop new sphincters. And um, I was very fortunate, obviously. Uh, American fellowships are not easy to get in. I was on their program. And we developed uh, using animal experiments at the start, again, six to eight months within the labs at the University of Minnesota, um, working on rabbits, finding out where the sphincter was, denovating the sphincter, and wrapping a new sphincter to understand the concept of the gracilis muscle. And we found that the gracilis, aside from the other sphincter muscles, was probably the most suitable sphincter muscle to wrap around because it was long, slender. If it was disconnected at its distal end, it lent itself to wrapping around the anal canal. And above all, the gracilis did not contribute to the stability of the knee or indeed act significantly to contribute to walking or running. So we used the gracilis sphincter and uh, placed a pacemaker up there because uh, this sphincter for people of, uh, of physiological uh, understanding ha is essentially comprised of the majority of what are fast twitch fibers which are type 1, type 2 muscle. These type 2 muscles are used in athletes. You run 100 meters, you get, you get tired, the muscle cramps. If you're a, if you're a, 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 a 10 kilometer marathon runner, you probably have the indefatigable type 2 muscle. And our aim was to convert type 1 muscle from the gracilis to type 2 muscle using what was uh, at then a cardiac pacemaker. And cardiac pacemakers are still produced in Minneapolis, in Minnesota. So we had to do some dealings with the, uh, with the Medtronic group. And we got these cardiac pacemakers, and we fixed it onto the muscle. And over a period of six months, we found that there was a significant type, one, type 2 to type 1 conversion, making the uh, gracilis muscle uh, similar to the anal sphincter that is uh, uh, short of fatigue. Having done that, uh, I was armed to my teeth with the knowledge of anal sphincters. If the sphincters went wrong, I knew where it was. If the sphincters were not talking to each other, I knew why. Uh, if the sphincters had been damaged, I knew how, what to put, do with it and put it right, so I came back. I came back to Sri Lanka, been about 15 years since I left, Para Denia, and then worked hard on neosphincters and the continent's work. Uh, fortunately for me, unfortunately for the country, there were a number of young people, soldiers, uh, combatants, both sides of the divide, who had bottom ends blasted as a result of the Johnny Mines, and they were lent to have permanent colostomy. So we offered the army and all the social organizations, look, we can fix this. We can create what is an abdominal stoma into a perineal stoma, give it a while, wrap the gracilis, and then let's see how it goes. And the bottom line, of the World Journal of Surgery, modified dynamic gracilis neosphincter is a paper that resulted from that. Remember at that time, a pacemaker was 1.5 million rupees uh, in Sri Lankan, and we could not afford that. So we modified it. I'm not going to spend time. You can read the paper. Uh, and we had a good 70, 80% success rate. Uh, this paper forms the basis for all of the gracilloplasty work that gets done in South Asia today, and in fact, Asia now. Um, uh, so then, once we did that, for those of you people who had rectal cancer involving the sphincter, we could not preserve the sphincter. We removed the whole thing, did an AP resection, joined uh, the colostomy to a perineum, and did what was called a total anal reconstruction after APR, wrapping the gracilis. Not great results, but semblance was enough for people who did not want to have colostomies. And not only did we do some of them here, but the India's first for this low rectal cancer was done by yours truly and in the team in India at the Tata Memorial Hospital for which they're ever so grateful. But they do not publish my name on it because they say that's the Tata policy. We don't uh, have anything outside Tata doctors who will write this paper. So I said, fine. Uh, now when you've got something at the back end, it's like a crab 
clawing at your back, right? And uh, in, in, in the process of developing this sphincter and converting it to a type one muscle, we used a technique called biofeedback. This brain is an untapped resource, and we understand that if you keep feeding the brain, keep teaching the brain and teaching it time and again, it soon learns. And soon these people with these sphincters were able to, uh, to, to gather a degree of continence that were unbelievable. And the people who helped out there was uh, Nalin the Munasinger on the left. He is now a senior lecturer in uh, breast and endocrine surgery. And the great lady on the right was the uh, Geetani uh, Ratnayak, who most G GI surgeons, physicians know, and stoma nurses know. She kind of the first, uh, first stoma care nurse in Sri Lanka, certified by the international organization. She spent a lot of her time, does spend her time uh, teaching and propagating stoma care in Sri Lanka. We now have a diploma course uh, as a post-basic post nurse training school course that uh, provides diplomates in stoma care. And so stoma care is well and alive. People don't have to wear the banana leaves and the, and the coconut shells and all of the silly, silly bags that they used to use those days. We really have stoma care bags that can be produced at low cost and patients get taken care of in the privacy of their homes because of stoma care nurses across this country. Uh, we need to be grateful to Gitani. I said it's mutilating, it defaces you, it's very upsetting, and local recurrence is a huge problem. So um, we looked at why and what happens. He, most people thought that if you did an AP resection, you would get rid of the cancer and if that was the best deal. But we found that in this paper, they had local recurrence rates of 47% of almost one half of people who got the AP resection also got uh, local recurrence. Now, not only are we giving these people uh, a mutilating operation that probably took them off their lifespans and their life tracks, but also gave them, a few years later, gave them recurrence. That was not good enough. And so we studied this in detail and wanted to know why. And uh, the question is exactly there. Why 5% in some, and why 47% or 50% in others? And this is the answer. If you have a cancer within the rectum and it spreads onto the outside of the rectum, which is enveloped by this fatty layer, if you can take that cancer out one piece with a two millimeter margin, you'll get a 5% recurrence. If the surgeon, out of lack of knowledge or is careless and removes it with uh, the incision going through the tumor, you get a 45% recurrence. And so, uh, we had ways of looking at it in Minnesota. We looked at it with ultrasound, uh, but we found that ultrasound is good for close vision, but not for distant vision, whereas MRI gave you a whole picture of what's going on. So you had what is like a globe, uh, Google map of the rectum, uh, the prostate gland, vagina, if you like, and the bladder, and we know exactly how to plan and when to plan and what to plan. Ultrasound at that time was fine for close vision, but you can see that on the left-hand side, that ultrasound didn't give you the images of the prostate gland and the urinary bladder and the vagina, if you like. Um, we also then took on the work. Uh, I think you'll be proud, uh, Prof. Ratnatunga and uh, the chief guest tonight. This is your son. He did a lot of the work with pelvic floor uh, dynamics. Uh, and Kesara was, when he was with us, a registrar, he um, looked at uh, dynamic, not only structure, but also function of the pelvic floor. How could we look at this better? And we produced a protocol for dynamic MRI of the pelvic floor, which most people use now. Um, if that was not good enough, we looked at local recurrence in rectal cancer. And there, are, uh, there is uh, this paper uh, that said that if you have a positive resection margin, in, and that alone is the single factor affecting local recurrence of rectal cancer. Proud to say again that this paper was produced by the first author was Buddhika Dasanayaka, who's here. Uh, both Kesara and Buddhika are great alumni of uh, Peradenia, and they also serve in the Peradenia uh, Medical School as surgeons. Uh, I'm very proud that you've come through our projects and uh, developed some critical thinking skills. And so uh, when Buddhika produced this paper, we also had uh, uh, methods of thinking of how if you have uh, a tumor that uh, arises on the outside of the fat, uh, you're going to have to re 
push that back in one way or the other because if you don't, there is no space down there. You have to do something and that's when radiation came in and we used radiation to push back the tumor uh, and what we found was long course radiation uh, from my work in the US uh, pushed the tumor back which means it downstaged the tumor and also made this tumor small which means downsize the tumor. Once you have a downstage, downsized tumor, you push the back tumor back to its original limits where you now have the potential for uh, delivery of a safe margin. Uh, so that in essence was the work. We're talking about film here. Uh, if you know what uh, Clint Eastwood said, here's the dirty dozen and I'd like you to, uh, uh, to introduce you to all those uh, unsung workers who are now uh, successful people in their part of the world uh, who were the dirty dozen, all of them were first authors uh, of papers and we produced a lot of papers in rectal cancer and that's them. So on the top row, uh, I'll spend a minute if I may, is Tamar Pereira. Tamar left us. He's now the professor of uh, liver transplant surgery at the University of Birmingham. Uh, proud product of Kalania. The second person next to Tamar is Michael Silva. Left us again after all of that training. Uh, Michael heads the hepatobiliary and pancreatic team at the Oxford NHS Trust. The third person also left us. He did, they didn't like me after they left, uh, finished their research. Uh, Ruan Vijay Surya, bright guy from Colombo, uh, again did all the work on lymph nodes in rectal cancer, uh, radiation therapy, and he left. Uh, he's now a, a, a fully fledged practicing consultant in the teaching system in Perth. Thomas Poskus is, uh, was a foreign fellow who worked with us for a year. Uh, Thomas left to his country. He is now the professor of surgery in Lithuania. Uh, the fifth person is uh, the actor. Uh, he's Pulatis Sirivadana, again uh, the son of a proud alumni, first batch of Peridine, Dr. S.S. Jairatna. Uh, Pulatis is left me again, left us. And he is now the reader of, in surgery in the hepatobiliary unit at the Royal Free Hospital. Ku Chan was a visiting fellow. He is now an academic surgeon in Johor Bahru in Malaysia. Uh, the rogue on the left bottom is Buddhika Dasanayaka. Uh, he's changed since. He's grown his hair. Now I can't recognize the guy. Uh, but he produced the work on all the margin resection. Kesar Ratnatunga produced a couple of books, actually, ch book chapters on rectal cancer and also did all the pelvic flow work. Uh, Vasanta Bijenayak in the middle uh, looks like Telly Savalas. Uh, for those of us who know Telly Savalas or Yul Breiner, he now heads the Department of Surgery at KDU. And the last three, Rohan Siriwa, the um, professor of surgery, the person who did the first liver trans live donor liver transplant, still at Ragama, promote Chandra Singers doing very active work in rectal cancer also at Ragama and Sumudu Kumarage, they form the, the core of the GI uh, operating system and also the um, uh, research uh, front at Ragama, uh, place that I serve with love. So after all of that, this paper is going to be coming out in 2023, published in the BMC Cancer, and basically what we've done is found that the overall local recurrence, refer you to the arrows in the last two sentences, the overall local recurrence from an unacceptable 50% to an acceptable 10% is now to 6.5%. And that has come out of multidisciplinary teamwork. Uh, the picture you see is that of Professor Janaki Heva Vicente. She's a pathologist who's been with me for 21 years in all of this research work, so she's an author of every paper that we produce. She's now the dean, an unvoiced person, but uh, my gratitude goes out to her. So what I was uh, re referring to at the start is very much what I'm saying now. I think you need to be brave to be an academic surgeon on the front line pushing the envelope. If you don't get there, you will never get there. Uh, patients will never get there in the end, or you won't push the frontiers of medicine and surgery. And I think there has to be a degree, degree of risk taking in this balanced risk, if you like, and the statement arises from that experience. Physicians must be able to practice medicine that is informed by their years or other years of medical education, training, experience, and the available evidence freely. 
and without threat of punishment, harassment or retribution, much of what we see on social media today. Uh, I think if we, don't, if we don't heed to these words, medicine will just fade off into being uh, just an everyday person's job. Everyone will be a medic. Nobody will be really pushing the envelope and taking uh, our medical uh, skills right to the extremes. I think the quest of excellence arises from just in that dissecting room, which you don't have anymore, but the similar things. Uh, in order to be able to uh, provide uh, excellent uh, care, you need to have excellent data. Uh, and uh, in order to be able to have that, you have, to have the heart for excellence in research. And it is now my dream, as I see medical education fading off into uh, what is uh, uh, something that I can't and cannot understand. Uh, we, I think in my mind, and I'm very open about what I say, uh, we are creating average, run-of-the-mill doctors by this new medical curricular method by the number of people we have in medical schools. Uh, when I was a professor of surgery at Kalanir, we had a whole uh, entourage of previous uh, PGIM chair people coming up and visiting us and vice chairman and saying, what is it that we want in Kalanir? I said, please, can you reduce the numbers? When I was in medical school at, in 1978 to 83, we had 98 in a batch. We had seven teachers in surgery. In 2020, we have 250 in a batch, seven teachers. How do you expect medicine to be taught? I am seriously thinking of getting some smart colleagues together with some business brains and starting the first internet school of medicine in Sri Lanka and for the world, really, because you can do that on the internet. You don't want uh, medical schools for this. So that is my dream. If, for instance, the medical education unit at Peradini, please do this, please take heed, if you can develop a team that identifies bright students and develop critical thinking within that student for the five years, you have produced at least a few who will take our profession to a next level. Otherwise, we will stay where we are and everything else will happen uh, as per everything else that happens. Uh, very grateful to some of those teachers who really touched my heart. Uh, and gave me some, some important stuff. Uh, Professor Barnaboke, I don't need to point to the, these gentlemen and the lady because you all know them. Professor Barnaboke had this knack. I was just a third year medical student um, uh, sitting in his pathology uh, class right at the back but could hear him. He had this knack to take uh, a formally filled specimen of what for me was a piece of uh, dead wood really and he would be able to describe every detail of that. He would be, ex be, be able to describe the front, the anterior, the north, the south, the posterior, and every aspect, and come up with a specimen that made sense. And that got my thinking, that you need to be critical, you need to be observant, and, uh, and although I am not a pathologist, his teaching taught me something that I carry on today. The gentleman down in the bottom is Professor Nimal Serenayake, Again, a, a respected teacher of mine and Professor Shanti Mendes, both of them, at a very young age of mine, taught me about data science. They taught me about how to manage data, uh, how to be a scientist despite the fact that you are a busy clinician, and to operate data in a way that meant meaningful uh, messages to the, to the people. Uh, the gentleman right on the top left is Professor Alui Hare. Uh, he has his finger pointed to wherever, whether if it's not in the anal canal, it's at you, and, uh, and what I've done with those two fingers in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, the cartoons there, he had this trick. Uh, you can't, Professor Sergei can't do this trick anymore. He had you in the ward class, he had this test tube full of urine. Uh, they used to do Benedict's testing, uh, but he had this test tube full of urine and he put his middle finger in and he tasted his index finger. And if you were not smart enough, you would put your hand and say, do it now. And if you were not smart enough, you put your middle finger in and test the urine. Of course, for a first start, you can't test uh, urine taste for sugar. Uh, you need to know that. So that's a 
complete crash of basic science. And the third thing, of course, the second thing is that you got to observe him. And he taught me the powers of observation. He taught, the, taught me that if you're not observant, you don't make the grade, and that was it. So he taught me a lot. And of course, the gentleman right down the bottom, uh, a revered and respected teacher, Prof. Ratnatunga. Prof. Ratnatunga was silent. He'd work, he'd work, and he'd work. And he taught me that surgery has got to be your first wife. Surgery has got to be your second wife. You, surgery has got to be a third wife. And being a Muslim, uh, I'm allowed four wives. Uh, I'm sorry about that. And my good wife, Shanaz, was my fourth wife. She really is my wife. Uh, and I'm ever so grateful to you for having endured all those difficult days, or tough days for me when I spent in Ragam. I used to leave home at 6 o'clock, have dinner every night at 1 o'clock, but produce these wonderful people who are now here to take on uh, the role of what we undertook many years ago. Remember, everything leaves a mark. Um, so whilst my teachers have left a mark on me, I, I can only think that I have left a mark on them to take this to a different level. But also, the encouraging thing from this cartoon is that although when we were young, we, did, we used to think about, hey, how, how are you going to live as a surgeon for the rest of your life? You, you know, you become de-skilled, your dexterity goes away. Uh, whereas if you become a physician, you can at least see patients. So, uh, you know, when you're 65 years and older. But here it is. Uh, after this, we have enough skill now to become a tattoo artist, and this is an advertisement for surgeons. You have a job waiting for you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir. Um, Sri Lanka, and so to say the entire world, has been fighting rectal cancer for decades. And tonight's vivacious lecture could not have been more timely and profound. We are so grateful to have had the opportunity to learn from one of the best in the field. We have now come to the final part of this inauguration ceremony. I call upon the Congress Secretary, Dr. Chatrika Dandaniya, to read out citations of academic staff members who are unable to be present today, and then propose the vote of thanks. Dear honored guests, as I told before, there are a few teachers who retired from service from the Faculty of Medicine of University of Peradeniya and the teaching hospital Candy, who for un uh, unavoidable reasons could not be present here with us today physically. Nevertheless, it would not be uh, right for us to forget them and would only be right for us to introduce them to the esteemed audience and to be felicitated in absentia. Professor G.H. K.K. Gunavardhana, MBBS, MD, FRCOG. He was well known for his skill in leadership administration as well as charisma. He claims intellectual rights for 20 textbooks and guidelines, 11 medical inventions suitable for low resource settings, 30 published full research articles, and 65 national and international abstracts. He toyed in his efforts to reduce maternal mortality and morbidity, infrastructure development, and preparation of guidelines for the local setting. Going beyond medicine, he has done extensive philanthropic work, including, but not limited, to upliftment of Buddhism in Sri Lanka. He received the most outstanding Sri Lankan award in 2017, and one of the highlights of his career was the receipt of the national prestigious title of Deshabandhu for designing and creating a neonatal resuscitator, which is currently in use in the hospitals of Sri Lanka. Dear President, members of the Council, and distinguished guests, I present Professor Kapila Gunavardhana for felicitation by our esteemed audience in absentia. <laughs> Dr. Indunil Vijayvira, MBBS, MD, MRCP London, UK, and FRCP. 
obtained his primary medical qualification from the University of Peradeniya in 1984. Having obtained his MD qualification a few years later, he received his post-MD training in neurology from the Institute of Neurology, Colombo, and later St. Bartholomew's Hospital and Royal London Hospital in UK and Royal Preston Hospital in Preston, UK. He was appointed as a consultant neurologist to, the, uh, to General Hospital Badulla and later to General Hospital Kalutara. In both centers, he showed his commitment to work by volunteering to conduct epilepsy clinics at district hospitals within the provincial directorate. Later, he took up the position of consultant neurologist at TH Candy in 2005, where until retirement, he taught and trained countless generations of medical students, registrars, and senior registrars in the art of neurology. Dear President, members of the Council, and distinguished guests, may I present Dr. Indunil Vijayavira for felicitation by PEMSA. Dr. Vasanta Disanayaka, MBBS, MD, FCCP, FCCPE, FACP, FRCP London. Having completed his MD in medicine in 1996, Dr. Disanayaka worked across several hospitals throughout the country, Nikambo, Polonnaruwa, and Anuradhapura being a few of its examples. Possessing strong leadership skills, he held many positions in scientific societies over time including presidency of the Anuradhapura Clinical Society and the Renal Society of Anuradhapura. He was the founder president of the Sri Lankan chapter of the IASP, International Association for the Study of Pain, and the Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine. He has been part of the inter international multi-center trials and is a research fellow of the WHO. In addition to medical undergraduate teaching, he has been a medical postgraduate trainer, as well as a trainer for various categories of paramedical staff. Following his remarkable career, Dr. Disanayaka retired from National Hospital Candy in August 2021. Dear President, members of the Council, and distinguished guests, may I present Dr. Vasanta Disanayaka for felicitation by PEMSA in absentia. <laughs> Dr. S.C.A. Arambe Poller, MBBS, MD Psych, and FSLCP Psych. Dr. Shyama Chandani Abhayvikrama Arambepola is an alumnus of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, passing out in 1983. She later qualified as a consultant psychiatrist in, and since 1993 has been serving different regions of the country with undying enthusiasm. Particularly, her special interest and expertise in child and adolescent psychiatry would have provided solace to countless families. She has an undergraduate and postgraduate. Uh, she has been an undergraduate and postgraduate teacher, trainer, and examiner for several years. Dear President, members of the Council, and distinguished guests, may I present Dr. S. C. A. Arambepola for felicitation by our esteemed organization in absentia. <laughs> Dr. W. M. M. Arambepola, MBBS, MD, DCH, FRCP, FSLCP. Dr. Arambepola graduated from the University of Colombo in 1982. Following postgraduate training, he qualified as a consultant pediatrician in 1991. Since his first appointment, he has a history of uninterrupted service in large pediatric units across the country. His special interest in thalassemia uh, was channeled into introducing screening programs, improved patient care, books on anemia and thalassemia, and published research in the same field. He was a teacher as well as examiner for undergraduate and postgraduate students for several years. Dear President, members of the Council, and distinguished guests, may I present Dr. W. M. M. Arambepola for felicitation by our esteemed organization in absentia. <laughs> Dr. Dharma Samarakon, MBBS, MSc, MD, is an old girl of Ferguson High School, Ratnapura. She graduated from the Faculty of Medicine, University of Peradeniya, and initially pursued an MSc in Community Medicine. Later, she completed the Diploma in Transfusion Medicine and subsequently MD in the same field, and qualified as a consultant in Transfusion Medicine. She has contributed to undergraduate and postgraduate education in addition to her untiring service to the patients until her retirement from service following her tenure at National Hospital Candy. Dear President, members of the Council, and guests, I take great pride in presenting Dr. Dharma Samarakon for felicitation in absentia. 
Dr. Devika Kanapati Pillai, MBBS, MS, FRCS, Edinburgh, entered the Faculty of Medicine in 1975 and completed her primary medical degree in 1981. Soon after her internship, she embarked on a postgraduate career in surgery, an unusual and challenging career for a lady at the time. She rose to the challenge and completed her PG training with a three-year post-MS tra post, post training in plastic surgery. Obtaining board certification as a consultant plastic surgeon in 1991, she received her first appointment to National Hospital Kandy in 1992, the only plastic surgeon in the central province at the time. Throughout a career spanning 26 years, she continued to treat patients from all across the country. Mr. President, members of the council, and distinguished guests, I take great pride in presenting Dr. Devika Kanapati Pillai for felicitation by our esteemed organization in absentia. <laughs> that brings an end to the felicitation of teachers, and may I now pr uh, present the vote of thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a pleasure to propose the vote of thanks on behalf of the President and the Council of PEMSA at the ceremonial inauguration of the Biannual International Medical Congress 2023. This event comprising the pre-Congress workshops, inauguration ceremony, and the Congress tomorrow would not have been a reality if not for the tireless support of many people, some on the forefront while many behind the scenes. Let me start by thanking our chief guest, Professor Neela Kanti Ratnatunga, for accepting our invitation to grace this occasion. Forever by your side, supporting us in all our endeavors, Madam, you have been a true inspiration. Dr. Krish Tambaya Radhakrishnan, our guest of honor, has been a pillar of strength through the UK chapter of PEMSA for many years. Dear sir, thank you for kindly accepting our invitation and literally flying across the globe to be with us here today. Our Congress lecturer, Professor Kemal Dean, delivered a wonderful lecture tonight. Your work is truly inspiring, sir. Thank you, dear sir, for taking time off of your busy schedule to be with us today. Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Terence Madhujit, graced the occasion amidst all his work. We are honored to have you with us today, sir, and thank you very much. Professor Vasanti Pinto, Dean, Faculty of Medicine, has always been a wonderful and ardent supporter of the PEMSA. Thank you, dear madam, for being with us today and for all your support behind the scenes. This inauguration ceremony today and the Congress lined up for tomorrow is the result of countless hours of work put together by the wonderful team of people within the Council and the supportive committees. My heartfelt gratitude goes to all the council members who contributed with all their strength to make this event a success under the guidance of PEMSA President, Professor Tushara Kudagamana, and the Congress Chairperson, Professor H. Shanjavira. My co-editors were a joy to work with, being meticulous and timely. Thank you very much for all your support. IT support was provided through the undying support of Dr. Anura Rajpaksha and his team and kudos to a job well done. We are truly grateful for accommodating even our last minute requests without complaint. We had three very successful and fully booked pre-Congress workshops this week, and I take this moment to thank all the resource personnel, hospital directors, and the ancillary staff, and all the attendees for their utmost support. I would like to thank the felicitated teachers who kindly accepted our invitation to be here with us today. It was a small way to commemorate and to show our gratitude to your immense contribution to the future of medical field. We have an excellent scientific program lined up for the Congress tomorrow, and I invite you all to participate in that. I must thank the members of the Scientific Affairs Committee who worked hard to put together an unparalleled academic program. My gratitude also goes to all the chairpersons of the sessions tomorrow and the resource personnel who accepted our invitation to add color to the event. An event of this magnitude would not have been possible without adequate funds. We had a wonderful fundraising committee who helped us all along the way. Our special thanks go to all the sponsors who stood by us to make this event a success. Students of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Peradeni, have assisted our efforts in many ways. A big thank you to all of you. You are the future of PEMSA and our organization is lucky to have such brilliant, brilliant young fledglings. 
Last but not least, a big thank you to, Dr. Uh, to Mr. Tusita and his amazing staff at Hotel Grand Canyon for being so helpful, accommodating, and just simply wonderful. If I have failed to mention any of you by name to extend my gratitude, I offer my humble apologies. It was not intentional. Once again, let me thank all of you who, has help, who have helped us in organizing the PIMSA Biennial Congress 2023. And lastly, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your accepting our invitation and gracing this occasion with your presence. Before I wind up, on behalf of the Council of PEMSA, let me invite all of you to our reception. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you, Madam. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the conclusion of this memorable evening. We hope tonight marks the beginning of a fruitful Congress that will open your eyes to the light of new knowledge. As Madam mentioned, you are all cordially invited to the reception and fellowship which has been organized for you. We wish you a very pleasant evening and hope to see you all tomorrow at uh, tomorrow's scientific sessions at the Oak Ray Regency, which will commence at 8.30 a.m. Dear ladies and gentlemen, could I now request our gracious audience to rise from their seats as the procession leaves the hall. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It has been a pleasure being your hosts tonight. I am Umangi Karnaratna, and my co-host, Pavita Bekon. Thank you, and good night. <laughs>